Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a weekly Beatles podcast talk show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a show in which we talk about anything and everything Beatles. Whatever we feel like talking about, you never know from week to week what it will be. It could be any part of their history, any part of their music, the past, the present, the future, whatever we feel like talking about at the moment. And I'm Ken Michaels, one of the three regular co-hosts. You might know me from my other Beatles radio program, which is a syndicated radio show heard on uh, over 30 radio stations right now called Every Little Thing, the Beatles syndicated show called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my two other regulars. First of all, a musicologist who has written the books, The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and also got that something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. And he's also a freelance writer who for many years wrote in the classical department at the New York Times, also writes for the Wall Street Journal and other publications, that being Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. And we also have our full-time Beatles writer, who writes for Billboard, Variety, Access, that's AXS.com, Goldmine, a whole bunch of other publications. He's also the author of Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones, and that is Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. And I should mention that Alan sold a copy of From the Cavern to the Rooftop this week <laughs> to, a, to a, a, a listener. Isn't that right, Alan? Yes. Yes. I got a, we, got, we got a mail at the group uh, email, the things we said today, email uh, from someone who bought it and read it. And uh, so after how many years, um, someone finally bought another copy of that book. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure we've sold a number of copies since we started mentioning the book here. That could be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on the show this time, we're going to finish up our conversation on the Beatles' mono versus stereo, and talk about the rest of the Beatles' catalog from the White Album on. Before we do that, we have uh, a bit of news to get to. First of all, uh, one of which involves the Beatles, their company, Apple Core. And Superfilms filing a lawsuit, which is against 48 internet dealers. Uh, would you like to talk more about that, Steve? You wrote an article about this yeah, in Billboard. I, yeah, I wrote a, a, an article about the lawsuit. It was filed February 1st against 48, basically, internet dealers. According to the lawsuit, um, the, they, well, they filed it in Florida, um, but the sites are all over. Uh, all over the place. It's not just Florida, and they also some some of the the uh, uh, goods are on Amazon, eBay, uh, Bonanza, and Etsy, and it's basically a counterfeit, unauthorized uh, sales of uh, Beatles merchandise uh, is what it is. Mm-hmm. So, which, which go is ahead. pretty widespread. Well, yeah, internet. I mean, and and but I mean, this is a they. The fact they went after forty eight companies. This is not just one company this time. It's it's quite a few. And they're trying to they're getting trying to go after domain names, uh, you know, websites, uh commercial sites that are selling the the stuff. Right. And it had and the, the the website had all the the legal you know, the legal uh, jargon about inferior quality and all that stuff, which you know, which is normal in these kind of lawsuits. But in any event, there that's that's the uh, situation. It'll be interesting to see where that goes. Right. Also, there is news about a new film coming out on March 23rd, which I only just discovered yesterday when I went to a movie theater. It's called Isle of Dogs, and um, it's an American stop-motion animated adventure film. And it takes place in the future. There is an outbreak of canine flu that uh, forces the mayor of a Japanese city to banish all dogs to a deserted island that's been used as a garbage dump. And uh, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because the movie has a a huge ensemble voice cast, and Yoko Ono is actually part of it, along with Jeff Goldblum and Bill Murray and Edward Norton and a whole bunch of other people. So that's something to look out for. All of our Yoko fans will be excited about it, getting involved in anything. I'm just happy that Yoko's active at all, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, she is um, 84 years old. Oh, she's going to be 84 
very soon. Actually, like next week. Yeah, that's right. So, so we'll say happy birthday in advance for Yoko here. Right. Also, I don't know if any of you have seen this. I saw it posted on Facebook. There are new T-shirts and mugs that are being made uh, that have John Lennon's face on them, which have uh, the classic line from Imagine on there. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. And the proceeds from the sales of that are going to Americans for Immigrant Justice. And there's a website where you can buy all kinds of stuff for DACA, but they're tying John's Imagine song with that, which is really a perfect marriage right there, I think. Want to comment, anybody? Um, well, John was an immigrant, and so is Yoko, so uh, you could see why uh, why that issue might be close to Yoko's heart. I mean, uh, among other reasons, even if they weren't, it might be. Uh, but, um, yeah, it's it's... It's interesting that she's gotten involved in that. She also was at the Women's March uh, that was right. recently held. So, um, you know, Yoko may be, uh, you know, we see pictures of her in a wheelchair and she may be getting frail, but she's still out there campaigning for what she believes in. That's right. She's right. still our Yoko. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we're proud of her for that. Um, also, uh, a few things about... Um, some events coming up at the Fest for Beatle fans. Jeff Slate, who we all know as being a writer for, oh, Rolling Stone, uh, Beatle fan, <laughs> a whole bunch of different publications. But he's a musician that has recorded a lot of music with various bands, one called Birds of Paradox, named after John Song. And um, he recently co wrote a book that was a biography on Roy Orbison called The Authorized Roy Orbison with Roy's three surviving sons, Wesley, Roy Jr., and Alex. And it just so happens that at the Fest for Beatle fans, where Jeff will be a guest, Roy's sons are going to be there. And they go as Roy's boys, and they're going to be talking about uh, their father, his life, his career, his relationship with the Beatles, also the Traveling Wilburys, and they're also going to perform with Jeff and his band. So that's a really cool idea to get Roy Orbison's three sons together and be in a band with Jeff Slate. And that's going to take place at uh, the Fest for Beatle fans, which is March 9th, 10th, and 11th. And that's at the Hyatt Regency on the Hudson. And uh, they're supposed to be there all three days for the weekend. Also, uh, for the last five years, there has been a Beatle convention in San Diego, the San Diego Beatles Fair. And um, it's taking place on March 31st this year. Pete Best will be a guest there. But there's also going to be someone that I think a lot of Beatles fans will be curious to hear talk, and that is Zach Nilsson. And he's the son of Harry Nilsson, hmm. who will be talking about his father. And Dave Humphreys, who organizes the event uh, with his wife, Robbie, he has a band. And... Um, Zach Nilsson's going to be performing in that band. Kind of similar with what Jeff Slate's doing <laughs> with Roy Orbison's son. So a nice little parallel there. To bring this back a little full circle, it'll be interesting to see whether the San Diego Beatles Fair manages to retain its name um, for very long. Because when, when Apple is in a crackdown mood, they go after people who use the word Beatles in a name, as Beatlefest, for instance, is now the Fest for Beatles fans, and somehow that locution works, but um, but Beatlefest didn't. I, I, I don't really know why, you know, that distinction <laughs> is what it is, but uh, but they they really crack down on that stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Be Beatlemania well, too. The show. I mean, they sued them. That's so. true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens there. Okay. So uh, our main topic is the mono versus stereo Beatles, and we're going to talk about that. But first, we actually got uh, a letter from one of our listeners who had a lot of comments to make about what we went through in our last show. Mm -hmm. And Alan, you want to read that letter? Yeah, since most of it has to do with <laughs> things that I said, uh, or a lot of it does. Um, we, we also got a lot of comments on the YouTube um, channel as well, um, and a lot of people have enjoyed hearing about the various differences. Uh, you know, people come to this with different levels of, of expertise in this. Some people have never heard the 
they were different before and other people know all about it. We got a letter from um, J.D. Mack of Silver Spring, Maryland, who wrote, uh, he is in the category of knows a lot about it. Um, gentlemen, I love the show, but this week there were too many times when I wished I had been part of the panel discussion so I could have added my two cents, hence this email. Here are some comments I wanted to make regarding various statements made. Norwegian Wood, mono mix, at 1 minute 20 seconds, I can hear the sounds good concurrent with the words told me, as in she told me she worked in the morning and started to laugh. And he's basically responding to my saying that I couldn't hear it. Um, I I have gone back and listened, and I still can't hear it. I hear a little bit of something there, but I can't swear that it's that. Having heard the bootleg and hearing that track isolated, I know that that said, I just can't hear it in the mono mix for whatever reason. He then goes on, run for your life. The mono is at most two seconds longer uh, than either stereo mix. However, the Mono Rubber Soul CD has about 10 seconds of silence at the end of the song for some reason. Perhaps Steve was looking at the CD time and concluding that the Mono mix was 9 seconds longer. Uh, Tomorrow Never Knows. Regarding Ken's comment, if the fade... If the fade-out was any longer, you'd hear the chaotic piano that can be heard on the Anthology Special Features DVD when George Martin and Paul Ringo and George are listening to the four-track tape of the song. Mm-hmm. Fast forward to 14 minutes, 33 sec- 36 seconds, in, quote, Back to Abbey Road, May 1995, close quote. That's the, the feature on the Anthology DVD. Um right. So he's just telling you where you can hear it. Then back to the letter. ending The ending of Here, There, and Everywhere, the descending volume swell guitar part, which is concurrent with the last word everywhere, is there in both stereo and mono. I'm not sure why Alan doesn't hear it in stereo. I'm not sure either. I did go back to it this afternoon, and yes, indeed, it is in both. So I don't know what... Um, you know, as I as I said when I responded to him, actually, you know, so with with these mono stereo things, you sometimes are listening like so intently, trying to hear, you know, something different that you hear things that actually aren't there, and you miss things that are there. And uh, I mean, I've changed my mind, I don't know how many times about um, about a lot of things uh, in the mono stereo th- thing. So. Okay, back to the letter. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. I was personally disappointed that the phasing effect in Giles Martin's Sgt. Pepper mix was not as pronounced as in the original mono mix. I find it virtually undetectable. Sgt. Pepper reprise. Alan, your initial thought was correct. There are two extra beats in the mono mix just before 1, 2, 3, 4. Interestingly, these beats were edited out of Giles Martin's stereo and 5.1 mixes, but they were included in the Dolby Atmos mix heard only in theaters on the one night it was played. Now that's interesting. Um, Can I make a comment? He said he did not hear the phasing in Lucy in the Sky? Yeah, he was disappointed that it wasn't nearly as, uh, as pronounced as it was in the original Mono White album. I, I, boy, I disagree with. I mean, I thought it was fine. Okay. I thought it was very, very listenable, very noticeable. But okay, okay, whatever. So you see, I mean, reasonable people can disagree about right a number of these. Things. Right. I think you you missed Penny Lane. Oh yeah, Penny Lane. The general consensus was that there was no real difference between the mono and stereo mix. In the stereo mix, right after Clean Machine and leading up to the trumpet solo, there are some ascending trumpet notes in the right channel, which are not in the mono mix. So there's something to listen for. I didn't have a chance to get to that today. Um, Hmm, I'll have to check that out. Yeah. I am the walrus. Ken, nice catch on the missing drum fills in the mono mix. I never noticed that before. So, yeah. So even J.D. Mack, heard that. who has noticed an awful <laughs> lot of stuff, didn't notice that. Um, I was listening, by the way, to an oldies radio station that was playing that version, mm-hmm. and I thought it was really cool. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's very noticeable about I am the walrus, at least for me anyway. Mm-hmm. So, Yeah. 
All you need is love. A minor difference of note. The US-45 has a fade-out that is about 1.5 seconds longer than the version on the mono Magical Mystery Tour CD, allowing one to hear two more notes of the Greensleeves melody. I don't have a mono Magical Mystery Tour vinyl album or any UK mono version, so I don't know if it's that way on all those releases as well. And then he concludes with, All You Need Is Love, the riff from In The Move, was not removed from the mix, as Alan stated, and in fact, the Beatles were sued for using it without permission. Yeah, I don't know about that. I mean, I seem to recall George Martin talking about how they did hear from the publishers of In The Mood, and that because of that, they removed it before they released the single in order to avoid a lawsuit. But I could Alan, be wrong. Hmm? Alan, he just now, just this moment, responded to your note. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He says, technically it was a settlement rather than a lawsuit. One of my sources of information about this comes from the Beatles recording sessions in the June 25th, 1967 entry about recording All You Need Is Love. George Martin met- mentions the settlement in All You Need As Ears as well. The riff in question can be heard at 3 minutes and 2 seconds and 3 minutes and 8 seconds in the 2009 Stereo Magical Mystery Tour. Okay, then. Okay? Yeah. Well, <laughs> How did he know we were talking about him? I don't That's know. <laughs> I, it, I swear to God, I'm sitting here just looking because I, I had printed out I, – I thought I had printed out the whole mail, and I didn't. And I went back to it, and all of a sudden it pops up, and I'm going, oh, my gosh. Yeah, so, I yeah. still I still haven't got a copy of that response. So I'm, you know, I'm looking at my email right now. Yeah, the magic of podcasting. You know, you get yep. email yep. right while you're talking about the guy's note. Well, right. Anyway, right. thank you, JD Mac, for um, settling some of these things and raising other questions. And uh, it's, um, you know, that's the thing about this topic. There's always a reason to go back and listen again. Well, you know, the, and the thing too is, there's so many sources now. I mean, everybody's I, in in doing these shows. I mean, I've been looking up, you know, as we all have, we've been looking up sources, and there's just tons of stuff. Mm-hmm. There is that, the books that are, I mean, the books that are out there. There's just so much to be written about this. It's crazy, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, and also it should be pointed out that to hear these things really well, the best way to listen is with your headphones on. Because mm-hmm. there's a lot of things that you're going to pick up in your headphones that you're not going to hear listening through your speakers. You know, and There's a lot of things that I picked up just from listening with my headphones on. That Because um, I hadn't listened to the mono for quite a while, and I listened in the last few weeks, and there are some things that I never heard before from yeah. listening to mono in, in speakers. So a lot depends upon the stereo that you're listening on and if you're listening with headphones too. Yeah. Yeah, you know what's another interesting thing about the mono and stereo? Since the stereo has basically been the standard version for so long, that when the anniversaries of albums came around, like, you know, every year when it was, you know, June 1st and it was the Pepper anniversary or November 22nd for the White Album, um, and I'd want to play the album on the date of its anniversary, I'd always go to the mono just because. I hadn't heard it quite as much, and it sounded fresher, you know, hmm. because you just you want to hear, you know, you, you, you're you never going to recapture the feeling that you had of playing the album for the first time. But if you're hearing a version that's just a little different than the one you're used to, you can get a little bit of that. Yeah, makes it a little special mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a listening experience. All right, so let's continue with more of our mono versus stereo. Before we get to the White Album, we had the single of Lady Madonna backed with the inner light. Who wants to comment about whether or not they heard any differences between the mono and stereo? Because I didn't. I didn't either. Brennan has, Brennan has, I'm looking at the Brennan entries, and Brennan has some stuff mentioned, but I, 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 I don't think I've heard anything either. I mean, I think these... You know the what he mentions are are really. I mean, the on Lady Madonna he says the decay on the last piano note is cut off on both mixes, but lasts longer in mono. That's you know that's something you really 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 have to listen hard for. I think mm-hmm. um, on Inner Life he says during the opening instrumental section 
a mystery instrument that may be a, and I can't read, Shahani, is different and better in mono than in, in the first section. So, I don't know. I mean, there's, I'm sure you can all, you know, you can, there's stuff you can find, but uh, I don't know that those differences are, are that uh, significant that, you know, we need to go into a whole lot of detail on them. So Yeah. Maybe um, we should remind everybody, Steve, when you say Brennan, who you're talking about. Yeah, we're talking about Joe Brennan's Usenet Guide to Beatles Recording Variations, which has been on the internet for God knows how long. It's at least 20 years, and it's still there, and it it was revised, I think, in 2000. And it's probably the be- one of the best, if not the best, uh, resource for this stuff, and it's free. If you, especially if you take the time to print it out, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, it's free uh, and it's it's excellent to have. It's excellent to have. So, all right, well, let's get into let's dig into the White Album then. Um, we'll start with back of the USSR, and maybe I should comment about that. Sure, because one thing right. that's the most obvious to me are the airplane sounds in stereo. They actually pan from the left to the right channel. Of course, you don't have panning in mono. And at least to my ear, as I think that Paul's vocal comes in just a little bit later in the mono version. Do you guys agree? I don't think I heard. I, I listened to both of those. You know, I had the that information. I was listening and I went, mm, I, I didn't notice. the If the panning is there, I didn't notice it. I didn't really see that big of a difference uh, in the two uh, myself. But in any event. Okay. Um, uh, I think also the plain sounds come in at different times in mono and stereo. Mm-hmm. I never never noted down, you know, the timings of when they come in in each, but I, I think they come in a bit differently. Right. All right. All right. Did you notice that there's more in one version than another? Or? No. I, I I didn't really um, didn't really time them or count them, but um, mm-hmm. I, I just think that there were there were there were some that came in at different times. That that was all. I mean, you know, they're mixing as a track and bringing sound effects in. I, they I guess didn't think it was that important that the sound effects match each each version. If it was that noticeably different, it's not really apparent. I did I didn't see that it was that different. It sounds pretty close to the same to me. Brennan does note a few other things that I, I haven't personally noticed, but I'll, I'm going to go back and listen. Um, uh, mono, he says, the the piano is louder at the very beginning when it when it comes in, uh, and that there is you can hear someone yelling after the open plane sound. That I think I do remember, and that there are drum beats after the last of the plane sounds that aren't heard in stereo. Um, whereas he says stereo has some extra guitar chords at the start of the solo, okay, and, and some different right. different shouting, different places, you know, during during the solo, the guitar solo particularly. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, there are some songs on the White Album for which I found no difference, and for me, Dear Prudence was one of them. Did you right. guys hear anything? Nope. No um, I I I did. Uh, he said there's a difference in the treble, and I did detect it but it again it was very it seemed to be very slight very slight mm-hmm. okay um oh blah dio blah da uh there's hand claps mm-hmm. in the introduction in stereo but it's not there in the mono mm-hmm. right that's it, that's definitely yeah you, i mean that's very noticeable so yeah yeah anything else that uh, you guys heard in nope, the two that, versions that was the big thing yeah, you know, it, I'm trying to remember. Was it that one that I said it sounded like something was missing when without the hand claps? Because um, it seemed that that space seemed a little dead. But um, yeah, I think that was the one. Well, uh, why don't we do it in the road? Has the exact same results. That's right. Um, there's there's no hand claps in the mono, but there is in the stereo. That's right. in the in, in the introduction. Yeah, so. no. That's actually that's. I'm looking at looking at my notes here, and that's it's, where I mentioned that. But it's the same same thing. Yeah. This could be a, the, a, one of the ways the Beatles are telling us that they prefer their mono mixes, you know, because you can't get the clap from them. Right. Oh, oh did you really say that? I kind of oh did. Oh my god! Oh my god! 
Ah! Okay. Just All when right. our listenership was growing. <laughs> <laughs> there, I can hear uh, the groans. I can hear the uh, groans all uh, the way, all the way through, all the way from here. Anyway, uh, all right. Wild honey pie. I didn't notice any difference. Nothing there. No. Alan, nothing. Nope. Okay, bungalow bill. The only difference that I heard was to me it seemed like in mono the bass was louder. For me, didn't notice that. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. You know, with some of that stuff, it 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 just has to do with the fact that you know you've got two different mixes are not going to be exact. So I, I tend to focus more on um, you know things that are there or aren't there in in one or the other. You know, I think if what we really want to get is the the isolated raw tracks. Um, want Apple to sort of put these out on a big hard drive and let us buy them all mm-hmm. so we can, we mm-hmm. can mix them ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yes. But sometimes when there's a difference of a certain instrument being more pronounced or hotter in the mix, it, it can affect whether you like it more that way. That's true, too, so, but it could also be a matter of a pressing. You know, you can get a, a, a German pressing and an American pressing and a British pressing, and one will sound like it has more bass and, than the other, and they may be exactly the same mix. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. I'm sure you've run into that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Definitely. All right. While my guitar gently weeps, oh, yeah. I picked up a couple of things, but I want you guys to comment first. Alan? Okay. Um, in the mono one, Clapton's guitar, like the uh, around the time of his solo, it stays like it stays at a high volume or you know relatively high volume after he plays the solo you you can sort of you know hear him continuing on with sort of you know what you might call guitar commentary a little bit more in mono and they've faded it out more completely in the stereo so that that to me is the main thing i hear um yeah that's i think the sound of his guitar is different it's mm. kind of more wobbly, I think, mm-hmm. in the mono in version. Mono. It, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Could be. And uh, Steve, did you hear any differences? Yeah, actually, I um, saw uh, I, what I heard was um, the stereo version has uh, George, you know, um, making some vocal sounds at the end while the mono doesn't. And you can hear the guitar much, cl- uh, much clearer in the mono without the you know the noise over it so that's hmm. that's interesting i have to listen for that because i know that the part towards the very end where you hear the yeah 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 that part um you don't hear that in the mono version right mm-hmm. right you know it's in the stereo but is that what you were talking about yeah but at, at the same time you can hear the guitar much plainer oh okay there. Uh, at that point, yeah. All right. Okay, that, there was a few differences right there. Happiness is a warm gun, I think, was different in a few aspects. What did you both think about that, Steve? I'll start with you. That one didn't didn't cross my path. I didn't I didn't uh, I didn't notice anything there. I don't have anything for that either. What you got, Ken? Really? Yeah. Well, I think that I heard more harmony between John and Paul. When the line comes in, lying with his eyes while his hands are busy working over time hmm. in the mono version. And I also think that the bass is noticeably louder in um, the I Need a Fix part okay. and also Mother Superior Jump the Gun. Listen with your headphones on. You can really hear the bass more in, uh, in that part of the song. Okay. Mm. Okay. All right. Uh, Martha, my dear, I didn't hear any difference. Nope. Nope. <laughs> We're in agreement there. Um, I'm so tired. Paul's harmony vocal, you could hear more. And the you'd say I'm putting you on part. Anything else maybe the two of you might have picked up on? No. Nothing there. Me okay. Yet. But you both you both heard that, right? Mm-hmm. You could hear more no. Paul than Really? No, I didn't hear I didn't hear it. In the mono part? Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, I think it's much more it's very noticeable in mono. Blackbird, Steve, what do you think of the two versions? I didn't. I, I, there's another one. I, I didn't. I didn't catch anything there. Alan, did you? 
Um, I didn't either, although it's conceivable the birds come in in different places since it's another one of those effect things. But um, right, and that's exactly what Brennan says. That's what Brennan says that the birds come in differently. I, but I, you know. So I, I picked up that there were more bird sound effects during the last verse in mono. And there's a different sound effect, bird sound effect, at the end between the mono and the stereo. Mm. So we need to memorize these bird <laughs> sound effects. Yes, there'll be a quiz. Just, <laughs> just some, like we need to memorize the piggies' sound effects, too. Some, pig, some bootlegger right. needs, to, need, needs to extract those and, <laughs> and, and put them out you know, as an outtake so that we can... We can go over them. Okay. We can study them. So, sp- speaking of piggies, any differences between both versions? How about you, Alan? Well, just the pig sounds. <laughs> yeah, the pig, so- the, pig, the pig sounds. Yeah, there's definitely some differences there. I, I mean, I wouldn't call them extensive, but, you know, there there is. it does seem like there are some differences. Yeah. Well, I heard a little bit more acoustic guitar up front. In the mono version, also the harpsichord, I think, was a bit louder, mm-hmm. and the, the sound effects of the pigs are different at the end because mm-hmm. the one in mono is a lot shorter than mm-hmm. the stereo one. Yeah. So, it's funny on the white album, a lot of things are different at the ends of songs. You know, mm-hmm. I think we have mm-hmm. another one coming up right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Nice segue there, Alan. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't pass me by. How about Ends the two different. of you talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> Fast <laughs> more than that. Faster. Much more than I mean, that, that. Yeah. There's yeah. I mean, that, this has got to be probably one of the two songs that have the biggest differences, you know, um, between the the mono and the stereo on the album. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, the, it's it's it, it is, the vocal is notably different. Um, in one than the other, um, it's it's just there's just so much there. The, speed the vocal is different. is different because it's faster, right? The speed's different, uh, which is which is a strange thing. Why would they have done something like that? I mean, was that? I can't imagine. Uh, you have to wonder if that was a mistake. If that if they really meant to do that, probably because they knew well, that everybody noticed it on "She's Leaving Home," so they figured, what the hell? Let's do it on Ringo's song. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, but you have to figure that since they cared more about mono first, and they worked on the mono mixes first, then the mono mix is the one that they accepted, the one that they approved. So, you know, I don't know if you both feel that way because they also put a lot of effort into the stereo mix here with the white album too. So, sure, yeah, mm-hmm. there's a lot of differences in the fiddle on this one and and the ending of course is completely different so i i really yeah. think the uh i really think the stereo one actually sounds a bit better right yeah, yeah there's also more fiddle throughout the song mm-hmm. in mono that's that's very apparent listening to it yeah. so interesting all right how about uh why don't we do it in the road well, we mentioned before, the only difference that I noticed was the hand claps. That's right. There's no hand claps in mono, <laughs> but there is in stereo at the intro of the song. So that's the only difference for me. And, I and will. That, and, and those, well, I was going to say, again, that's where it sounds like it's, it's really missing something without those hand claps. Um, it really sounds, you know, it, it just doesn't sound, it sounds better in the stereo with the hand claps. Mm. I agree with you, but then again, were you brought up on the stereo first, Steve? Yeah, but listening to the two side by side, you know, it still sounds there's. It kind of sounds like some dead space there without the hand claps. Maybe it's because, I mean, you're, you're you're right. I mean, you know, I'm more probably more familiar with the stereo than with the mono, but but still, not having those hand claps there, you know, it's definitely. Definitely noticeable. Mm. So. Okay. Uh, then we've got I Will. Any differences there, Alan? Yeah, I think the harmonies are, um, the vocal harmonies are a bit better balanced than the mono one. You know, on like where he sings I Will, and you he there's a sort of a lower harmony that comes out a little, little more strongly on the mono. Um, but it's mm-hmm. a pretty minor difference. Some right. people some people think the bongos are different. I mean, I listen very 
hard for that. And um, I didn't see, I mean, there was maybe a very slight difference, but it wasn't that big a difference to me. Did anybody okay. catch that? Anybody catch that? Mm-hmm. Are you talking about the bongos? Or are you talking about what? Well, I think that they're, uh, are they wood blocks at the end? I know there are bongos on the song, but it sounds like a wood block that gets played. No, I was talking about the bongo specifically. Okay. But I thought that, well, I heard more wood blocks <laughs> okay. uh, in the mono version, but I wasn't, I'm wasn't. i not certain about the bongos. Okay. And also, big difference is um, the stereo version has Paul doing the mouth bass. He actually sings the bass part in the first verse, and the mono version doesn't have that at all. So when you hear the bass in stereo, that's Paul singing it, actually. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Interesting effect right there. All right, Julia. That's another song for which, well, I didn't didn't detect any difference. Same here. I didn't get anything there. I didn't notice anything there either. Brennan doesn't even mention anything, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about birthday? That That was one where I didn't really hear a difference. Uh, extra vocals at the end of the second chorus in stereo is, uh, are the notes I wrote down. Um, anybody notice those besides me? No. no. Extra didn't. vocals in what sense are you talking about? Like, you know, at the end, I, I, or? I, yeah, I guess I guess so. At the end of the second chorus, no. I didn't hear. Oh, I'll have to listen for that though. Okay. I, I I don't recall that. No. Okay. Well, at least that's something. Your blues, I think, was a bit different for me anyway, because one of the biggest differences it seemed to me was that John's lead vocal was a little more distant from the microphone in mono. Mm -hmm. And also the guitar work was not as pronounced in mono. It sounds much more powerful. The whole song is more powerful for me in stereo. Do you guys agree? Mm, Don't know. Um, They both sound powerful to me. John's vocal is really clear in the stereo version. And it seems a bit distant. In mono, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mono, I think, gives you a, a few, a, a couple of seconds longer on the fade. According, Brennan says the the mono is eleven seconds longer. Eleven seconds. That's what it says. Huh. Okay. Uh, let's move on to sexy Sadie. I found it to be a little bit longer in mono, more guitar work and piano at the end in mono. That was about all that I heard. Did you guys hear anything different? McGeary talks about the bass being accidentally mixed out of the beginning of the song in mono and not heard till John sings Sexy Sadie. And I sat there and listened to it. And the bass is there, but it's, I mean, it's low, but it's it's there. It's not, I wouldn't say it's mixed out. Because of, I mean, he's basically saying you can't hear it, which is not true. You can hear it, but it's not very, it's not prominent at all. So. Okay. Alan, anything? Um, you hear a little bit of, uh, like, tapping at the end of the piano intro in the stereo one that uh, I didn't hear in the mono. Uh, that's about it. it. It seemed, you know, questionably significant to me but um but there's just that yeah and that was it okay (laughs) (laughs) well some of these differences are just slight and some of them are you know much more noticeable um everybody's got something to hide i myself didn't hear any differences i I didn't either nope all right after that we have to do helter skelter which is one of the biggest differences between mono and stereo versions of all songs in the Beatles catalog. Uh, Steve, you want to tackle that? Well, I mean, there's quite a there's quite a bit. I mean, it's not only is the stereo a minute longer. Ringo's, I've got my got blisters on my fingers that you. I mean, they're so such a big part of the stereo is not in the mono, which is also kind of strange that they would have put it on one and not the other. Mm-hmm. I don't know, Alan. Yeah. That's that's the big one. The blisters, of course, um, and the time difference uh, mm-hmm. is uh, significant. Mm, 
I yeah. think that's that's the main thing, really. Also, you know, the 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 fading in and out at the end. Um, well, yeah, the, the second, the, right. sec- yeah. the second, uh, yeah, the the way it bounces back in. Yeah, that's it. It's so strange that they would have done something like that. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, again, going back to "Don't Pass Me By," the with the with differences like that, you have to wonder what happened, and if maybe it was not meant to be that way. You know. Well, remember what I said in in uh, I think our first show on Mono versus Stereo when I spoke to Ken Scott about the White Album, and I said, "Why are there so many differences between the Mono and the Stereo?" And he said, "A lot of those were mistakes." So. You know, certainly when it comes to Helter Skelter, anybody who's so used to the stereo version, once they hear the mono one, they're in shock that it just fades out. You know, you expect it to come back in and you hear, like Steve said, Ringo saying, I got blisters on my fingers at the very end. And it's just not there. That is such a stark contrast. (laughs) It was such a big part of the song. And you got to wonder why they made that decision. In some ways, that's. That's just that's even more important to me than the differences themselves, why they were done. Right. Ken Scott has also said, and I can't place exactly where it was, uh, it might have been in his book, that um, that he brought up some of these differences to Paul, and Paul said to just sort of leave it that way because collectors will buy both versions. That strikes me as historically a little odd because back in 1968, I don't know that people were – collecting in quite that way i i don't remember hearing much about the differences um of mono and stereo versions plus we didn't even get the white album in mono in the u.s so it was a Mm. british only release so um or europe only uh so i don't know you know ken may be misremembering something or remembering something from a different era or something like that but um you know maybe he talked to paul about it way later and and Paul just sort of quipped about it being the kind of thing collectors were into so I'm not sure it happened at the time but but Ken has said that either either that or Paul was a hell of a visionary <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's so. very possible but something like Helter Skelter is so apparent the difference it's not like it could be a mistake mm-hmm. I mean you would think they would have attempted to fade back up even if they were late in fading back up Mm-hmm. You, you should do the same thing that you did in the mono there. So they knew what they were doing when they did it. Right. So, right. I don't know. It's very bizarre. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think that really pushes the, the argument that, as Ken Scott said, that they were some mistakes. I think that really, you know, gives it all the more evidence that that's indeed what they were. I mean, what there isn't really a more plausible explanation that I can think of. Um, uh, you know, do you guys, what do you guys think? Maybe. Um, well, actually, in this case, it can't be because the stereo mix was done after the mono, right? Right. So they knew enough to fade it back up and then have the ending. So that was a conscious decision that was made. Right. But, uh, well, all right, then... then so they, they should have gone back it. to the mono and, and mm-hmm. tried to reproduce that, and maybe they just didn't want to. Or maybe maybe, maybe they, they felt they, that um, okay, stereo albums cost uh, you know more than mono albums will give them um, the bonus of Ringo more? saying I've got blisters on my fingers. For... Or maybe no, maybe <laughs> nobody thought about it. Maybe nobody realized what they had done. Yeah, that's the that's... kind of thing that George Martin says. You know, I mean, when I've asked him about differences, he said, you know, we we didn't really care that much about that kind of stuff. But this is a little bit different than say whether the vocal on Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds has you know more the phasing, or phasing. Um, mm-hmm. this is like a whole section of a song that's not there right. on one version right so, right yeah hmm. all right so let's do the next song which is long 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 and I've heard that there are some differences but I have a tough time figuring them out <laughs> maybe you guys can help out well, depending song. on depending on the source, I mean, I I looked around for a couple of different sources, and one source said that the vocals were embarrassingly out of sync, which I think was a it's kind of hilarious because they're not embarrassingly out of sync. They are mixed. I will say they are mixed a little differently between the mono and the stereo, and I think probably the separation in the in the stereo, you know, 
gives it a little more depth in the in the stereo than in the mono. But I don't know that the um, that it's embarrassingly out of sync. I, I think they were just you know there's a little bit of different mixing there. I think that's all it is. I think that's all too. Yeah, yeah. There's supposed to be a difference in George's vocal. Like there, at some points it's single track and some it's double track. Mm-hmm. But you know I don't really know. I can't pick out the difference between the two. It's difficult for me. I don't know if your ears picked it up. So. Well, Brennan has a note here. We can we can um, credit him with this. Um, <laughs> double tracking starts at the, fir- the the first long in stereo, but doesn't start until the third long in mono. Or is that <laughs> is it? Yeah, no, that's it. That's that's the way he's he says it. Okay, uh, not everyone's ears can pick this up, so you got to be listening. Knowing that, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. You know, these it, recordings so. are these recordings are processed in so many different ways that um, you know some of these things are kind of like you you can think you're hearing a, a double tracking when you're not, you know, and that you're not hearing it when it's there. It's it's mm-hmm. it's tough. Yeah, right. I know. right. Got to have really sensitive ears <laughs> and, a, and a research grant. Right, <laughs> right, that would help. and a lot of and a lot of printouts in front of you. Mm. <laughs> that helps too. Uh, revolution number one. Uh, to my ears, I only picked up one difference. I don't hear the lead guitar part as much in the mono. It's kind of buried after all. I can tell you, uh, brother, is you have to wait, and also you better free your mind instead. I don't hear the lead guitar as much at those points in the song you know it's a little bit louder in stereo i mean that's the only thing i picked up how about you two that sounds about about right but i i didn't notice anything that i would think of as a a, a, as a significant difference Hmm. okay i I didn't i didn't pick up anything like i said single that's different of course yes Mm -hmm. (laughs) and we'll get to that in a few moments honey pie there was There's a, a little bit more lead guitar from John in the mono. Mm-hmm. After Paul does, um, this is while the guitar solo is being played by John. There's a mm-hmm. moment where Paul just goes, yeah. <laughs> then there's this chord that gets played. And then there's a little more playing in the background from John that you don't hear in the stereo. Right. Yeah. It's right. It's kind of a nice jazzy lead guitar solo too um and it's it's really nice hearing the extended version of it in mono that's that is mm-hmm. a nice difference mm-hmm. yeah and uh i think george harrison said that john sounded like django reinhardt <laughs> which is a hell of a, a, um, which is a hell of a compliment it, it, yeah it is and it's kind of weird given how john especially early in their career used to sort of you know uh, talk very disparagingly of jazz, but he mm-hmm. uh, seems to have had a feel for it when uh, given an opportunity. Mm-hmm. Or of Paul's, uh, you know, granny songs or dance hall songs. <laughs> granny songs, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, Savoy Truffle. Um, I picked up one thing: the end of the guitar solo in mono. You hear more of the lead guitar part. And then you also hear horns only for a while. And then in the last verse, I believe that you hear more rhythm guitar, the rhythm guitar part in mono than in stereo. Mm-hmm. That's what I heard. So. One reason you might hear more rhythm guitar in the last verse in mono is that um, the organ has been faded down which is a little more prominent before it. So in the absence of that, you're hearing other things that, um, you know, weren't calling your attention before that, I think. Right. Okay. Good point right there. All right. So we are now up to revolution number nine. And I think at this point, Steve and I should yield to you. Alan. <laughs> Well, Since that's sadly, your favorite Beatles. Yeah. Sadly, I believe that the Mono Revolution number nine is basically just the stereo summed as, uh, you know, 
So there's no, there's no actual they they didn't really do two mixes. I think they just did the mono mix and uh, I mean sorry, the stereo mix and then collapsed it into mono. Um mm. there is however an acetate version that has been bootlegged that um has some different mixing choices. I, I, I can't recall exactly what, but I know that, you know, when you listen to it, certain things sort of stick out that weren't in the standard version uh, that they decided to either, you know, mix out or cut or, or something. But mm-hmm. um, that was, that was one of the most significant outtakes to appear. You know, I mean, that caused, I remember that caused such a, uh, a rush from everybody when that thing first appeared it was like is this real <laughs> you know and it also linked revolution number one and number nine which was kind of cool mm-hmm. so gave you a better oh, understanding i don't mean, I don't mean that outtake i, I meant there oh. was a, <laughs> no there was, there, oh, was okay. there was an outtake um it was basically an acetate that was um cut during a uh a, you know during the mixing they would periodically cut acetates to take home and listen to. So, so this is really just not revolution number nine as we kind of know it, but mixed a bit differently. And then they went in and, and reconsidered, but uh, no, no, the one you're mentioning of course is, uh, is spectacular. That, that, right. that was a, a big moment in the history of bootlegging when that finally came right. out. Right. Yeah. It gave you a better understanding of all the, the different versions mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and how they came to be. So, all right. And the last song on the White Album was Good Night, for which I couldn't detect any differences. Right. Um, there's a, a difference in the way it kind of appears <laughs> on the two albums. Um, in stereo, it kind of, you know, fades in out of Revolution Number no. 9. You know, Revolution Number no. 9 ends, and then you hear the strings kind of like, you know, gently sort of swell up to full volume um whereas in mono uh it it seems to start a bit later partly because it doesn't fade in they just sort of they just sort of start it at full volume and i think mm. they're missing a couple of bars of what would have been the fade what was the originally the fade in in the stereo well, maybe not originally if the stereo was done second but so let's say the stereo mix has a little more finesse because of that fade in. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, all right. I will have to listen for that. I never noticed that before. Okay. So let's do a few more singles from the Beatles catalog. There's Hey Jude and Revolution. Mm-hmm. Let's start with Hey Jude. The only difference that I know of is the mono is a little bit longer. Yeah. I don't really have anything... Um... There is yeah, a, also the, of course, the the version on Twenty Greatest Hits. Remember the Twenty Greatest Hits album <laughs> from nineteen eighty two, where they what, what was it like four minutes or something? They really cut it down. <laughs> they got a lot of flack for that, and deservedly so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, when you hear so much about Hey Jude being seven minutes and eleven seconds, mm-hmm. you'd want to be as close to that, or making it as perfect as possible. So, Mm -hmm. but they had to cram all that onto one vinyl album. That was difficult to do. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Don't excuse that though. I mean, (laughs) we can't, we can't allow, excuse that. All right. But capitals at fault. Yep. Okay. Um, And then there's revolution, which we've talked about before, but always worth bringing up Mm -hmm. so much more guts, more ballsier and mono. Mm-hmm. At least in my opinion, certainly John said that, and I tend to agree. Yeah, that was so. just a bad stereo mix. Um, you know, sort of the the separating things so that it is, so that the cumulative effect of the band is gone. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's really bad. Uh, yeah. But it was you know it was an improved on the new version of the One Plus album. So right. Best but, you know, if you ever hear a revolution on the radio, they're going to play that stereo version. And it's a shame because I think more people would appreciate it if they heard the mono one. Yeah. It's dead. Actually, so. actually it, it, they should put the shooby doo version. That's the version that <laughs> would really – I mean, I, I, I don't know why they've let that stay somewhat buried. I mean, they've kept it for the video. I mean, that they should have, they should have put that out, uh, you know, made that more available. 
Because that's a fun. That's fun. That's a lot of fun to hear, you know. And you know, it's it's well. Anyway, definitely one of the Beatles' greatest rockers. Mm-hmm. And you know, love the fast version. Love that the Shuby Doo Wop version, <laughs> the faster <laughs> one too. Mm-hmm. All right, how about Get Back and Don't Let Me Down? Any differences, Alan? Uh, I haven't heard any ever. I, I, I think those were just sort of collapsed mixes as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. haven't heard differences either. And and there they could have they could have used one or put one or both from the the rooftop, and they didn't. You know, yeah. that would have been um, would have been a nice touch. And both of those versions were really you know rocking versions, but. Yeah. In any event. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also have the four songs from Yellow Submarine that appeared on Past Masters. Comments on those? Hmm. Well, Only a Northern no. Song was only, you know, is another one of those that only recently came out in stereo. And I didn't compare it. Did you guys? No, I didn't either. Hmm. I didn't really hear a difference. No. And the other three? No difference at all together now at all for me. Right. No. no. No, I didn't hear any differences with any of them either, although, you know, obviously with It's All Too Much, there's a difference in the film version, which has a verse that's not in the album version, but is right. otherwise much shorter. Right. D- did you guys see the um, when it was released to the theaters several years ago? um when they did that limited engagement, did you get either of you guys go to that? Mm, of Yellow Submarine? Yeah. No. Um, you, Alan? I saw it. Uh, we, are we talking about the 1999 re-release? Yeah, I think that's. Yeah, I, think I that's, saw that in the theater at that point. I got I got to see it in the um, Castro uh, Theater in the, in San Francisco, which is a beautiful Art Deco theater, and that song was just incredible it was just a wonderful and um one of the people actually that it that uh, showed up at that at that uh, showing was dr hieronymus who's who may be listening uh who who wrote that who wrote the uh, a book on on yellow submarine um but he, a periscope, he was scope i believe it's called right no or is that broad uh, access book <laughs> i think that's broad access ah, book uh, right. i'd have to i'm gonna Sorry, have to Bob. look up <laughs> I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to look up uh uh his his book um while we're sitting here. But yeah, he was there and um but that uh, that stuck in my mind that that mix it was just so amazing. I hope we don't know what they're going to do for the th- theater showing uh, if and when it happens here. Um but boy, I hope they do something really nice like that. I mean uh because they they have the mix floating around and let's hope uh they do something um they they use one of those mixes i know uh, charles rose and i was asking for the sing along but that mix that they used in 1999 was just absolutely astounding uh d- do you remember that uh, uh alan um i i don't really remember it being unusual in any way um mm-hmm. uh, other than you know i it was the first time I'd heard a lot of that stuff in surround. Um, so yeah, that in itself was a lot of fun. Um, Mm -hmm. but yeah, I found Bob Hieronymus's book was called inside the, inside the yellow submarine, the making of the Beatles animated. uh, Okay. Classic. He also did a news, uh, a newsletter called, uh, Hieronymus and company yellow submarine journal, which is what he gave out that day at, uh, at the, at the theater. But, um, yeah, uh, both of those are, both of those are on Amazon. But uh, yeah, I mean that was such a great such a great film. Yeah. Uh, I mean, such a they're great on Amazon. They're on Amazon, except that the I'm just looking at the paperback of um, Inside the Yellow Submarine: Making of the Beatles Animated Classic um, is going for two hundred eighteen dollars and ninety nine cents. And there's a lot. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so. Thanks. Okay. Well, it I, would be nice if they just show it in the theaters for a few weeks. You know, yeah, that, or show uh, it for one show it for one week at least. I mean, that's that's the type of thing where it's the type of film it has such a you know such a uh, 
an attraction for families. I mean, that would be something that, you know, parents would drag their kids to, you know, and 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 be happy to do, you know, as a as opposed to some of the junk that's in theaters now. I'm sounding like an a grump, sounding like a grumpy old man, but it's it's really true. I mean, they're you know, yeah. There's so many movie theaters now that will run a classic film for a week, you know, something well, even, uh, even even you know. Films from the the forties and fifties, you know, right. Casablanca or something like that. Right. Why can't they just do the same thing for Yellow Submarine? Well, they don't run them for a week. They run them for uh, one or two days. Because really? I saw, yeah, because I saw uh, Casablanca uh, over the winter. Uh, it was run for two days. Uh, uh, Turner Classic sponsored it, and they had a little opening um, for it. And and I love that because I had never seen Casablanca, and there was so much more to see. Um, on the big screen as opposed to you know on TV and the same thing is true with Yellow Submarine although you know we've all seen it you know we you and I and I mean we've all seen it on the big screen but a lot of kids have not and they would just absolutely love it so I'm hoping you know that they do it more than one night you know maybe maybe a week who knows especially the way it looks and sounds now you know i mean the colors are so bright and vivid in the sort of remastered version and with the surround sound it's just great it's just great it really really benefits from being seen in the theater on a big screen right it does Mm -hmm. it does yeah like you said it really is a family movie Mm -hmm. parents taking their kids i mean right so let's cross our fingers we don't know. We don't know what they're going to do if if they're going to do anything. So they haven't announced it, but we can we can hope that given that there's something happening in the UK, that something will happen here. So we'll see. All right. Are there any songs that we've missed? No, I don't think so. I don't okay. think so. Either. Well, then that puts a wrap on this show. And um, you know, if you have any comments about. Uh, our thoughts uh, on all these songs and the different versions, you can always write to us here. And our email address is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. There's any number of ways you can contact us, which we're going to get into now. If you would like to get in contact with us individually, first of all, Alan, why don't you give the folks your contact info? Um, you might as well just get me on Facebook, where I have two pages. One is just Alan Cozen, and the other is Alan Cozen Remixed. And if you send me a message to either, I'll see it. Okay. Steve, how about you? Um, Beatlesexaminer at gmail.com uh, is my email address. Um, you can also catch me on the uh, Beatles News and Information page on Facebook. All right. And as for me, Ken Michaels, you can email me at every little thing at att.net. You can also check out my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. Lots of interviews on the website with people connected to the Beatles, Beatles trivia every single week, where you can win one of nine prizes, and special contests that happen all the time at kenmichaelsradio.com. All right, this has been a fascinating topic. Who knows, you might revisit it someday in the future. Maybe uh, have some guests on and uh, get some other input on different versions of Beatles songs. So, for Alan Cozen and Steve Marinucci, this is Ken Michaels saying thanks so much for listening, and we will see you next time. Next time.